Why is it? Okay, wait a minute. There's that. Why are we not getting audio? Let's see here. How about now? Okay, we are using a different microphone. I've just switched over. I'm not sure what happened, but we will fix it. Hold on. Uh, monitor off so I don't hear myself twice. Okay, hopefully now you'll be able to hear me. Okay, so you missed all of my introduction, which was so good, and I didn't have any ums or hums or anything like that. So we'll have to do it again, and it won't be anywhere nearly as good. Anyway, um, today's show is not at all the show we thought we were going to bring you. We had planned to have uh, Dr. Ed Clutis um, on the show. He's a scientist here in Winnipeg who works on the Mars rovers, which is pretty cool. Um, but unfortunately, what happened was um, we had a bunch of things come up here in the sky. Well, and coming up in the sky. You've probably heard about the the uh, upcoming meteor storm that may be happening. If you haven't, you'll hear about it tonight. Anyway, I didn't want to shoehorn all of that in with an interesting talk with Dr. Clutus. So I, I spoke to him earlier today. We're going to bump him into early June so that we can give him the time that he deserves so that we can talk about all of the, the cool local Mars research that's going on right here in Manitoba so that we can cover this sort of late breaking news. So that is... Uh, that is our plan for today. We've got uh, some of your images, we've got the upcoming maybe meteor storm, and we've got the planets gathering in the morning and all the things that are going on there as well as cool space stuff and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to be doing for today. So let's get into it. First of all, I think, um, you know, I think we'll go to, to our mail first. I got a few images last uh, week that didn't get here quite in time to be able to um, fit them into the show. And now we'll just get our PowerPoint reconnected here. So we've got a couple more lunar eclipse shots that I wanted to share. Um, many of you got some great pictures of the eclipse and some of you uh, sent some stuff in. Uh, James's uh, pictures came in and were really nice. This is a beautiful shot of just after totality. Really nice shading there. This is, uh, this is a, with a phone camera held up to the eyepiece. And you can see that little star there that we were talking about that the moon had, had blocked out and then come back in. So this is a really, really nice shot. And he's got a little bit more of a, of a I guess, an earlier shot in the sequence. There's that same star except on the other side of the moon. And uh, this is a bit longer exposure, so you get a little bit more of the, of the uh, bright side sort of visible. Really, really nice shots, James. Well done. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be seeing some more of James's images uh, a little bit later on. Ulrich was out. Ulrika was out with... Sorry, I'm, I'll get your name right. I will, I promise, Ulrika. It, it, it sounds... I, I have a horrible... Um, Canadian accent when I speak German, so I apologize. Ulrika was out with uh, her binoculars, and she has already bagged uh, this month's challenge object, the globular cluster M3. We talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. And it's a beautiful cluster of stars near the, um, the constellation Boates, and nailed it with the, the binoculars, was out uh, under a nice dark sky. And then, not to be outdone, she has already started tracking down more and more binocular objects. Here's uh, something that, uh, actually her story was really great. It was it was basically, I was just looking around in the Milky Way and I found this thing. And then I went and looked to see what it was. And I think it was globular cluster M22. Well, it was. And um, what I really liked about this observation, it was a discovery. Now, granted, someone else discovered this globular cluster before Ulrika did, so she's not going to get credit. But that feeling of discovery... Uh, was very clear in her in her email. So thanks for sharing that, Ulrika. That was that was really um, it. Reminds me of sort of why we do this kind of thing. That that sense of discovery, that thrill of of tracking of, of finding something that you weren't expecting. So um, we'll uh, we'll take a look at um, at some other binocular objects uh, in future shows to make sure that uh, Ulrika and the rest of you have targets to look for. 
Here's another image that James sent in. James Fast, uh, this is a, a, a shot through one of his telescopes. He's got, a, he's got a tracking telescope, but it's not the kind that lines up with the North Pole. It's the kind that is just sort of computer controlled and does some, um, some math to sort of keep pointed at the same target. That doesn't allow for very long exposures. Uh, like a like a, a real tracking mount would, but James has managed to get by that and figure out a technique to get some short exposures and make it all work and stack them up together. And here's a great shot of the uh, the Great Orion Nebula M42 uh, and M43, this little comma shaped piece here. Really, really nice, James. And another one from James, the Pinwheel Galaxy M101. So. Uh, Obviously, James has caught the imaging bug and is uh, is getting right out there. Uh, keep sending us your pictures, your stories, your drawings, your paintings, or if anyone's written poems, whatever. Any 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 way that you interface with the sky and then record it is totally valid. So uh, we love to share that kind of stuff, and uh, I know it inspires other people to to try their own hand at certain things. Uh, and we love getting we love getting mail. So you can always send us mail either through the um, through the social media channels through our email space at manitobamuseum.ca or you can tag me at uh, scott the sky watcher on facebook and i'll be happy to uh, happy to chat with you that's also where i tend to go live every once in a while when i the 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 fancy strikes me i'll be out with the telescope and just decide to to do some live streaming because we can't schedule it it doesn't go out through the museum's page. It just goes out through my page. But uh, if you join us there, you'll, you'll get the notifications for that. All right. Let us move on. Oh, here's um, another image from uh, Dale and James. I think, I think we showed this one last time as well. Um, another eclipse shot. Just beautiful, beautiful images of the eclipse. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I just went through our... Um, our YouTube channel, the, the Eclipse show is now on our playlist there. I'm actually a little disappointed with my images compared to the images that you're all sending in. I was trying to like live stream, so it, it's uh, like a video camera, but these still photographs that you have all been sending in are just uh, fantastic uh, as well. Oh, and the, yeah, some of these are still on here from, from last week, the, uh, the Starlink train of satellites that we all got to see. Very, very beautiful stuff. All right. What we're going to do now is we're going to head off to the sky and take a look at what we can see. Hmm, isn't that interesting? It looks like There we go. Okay. Sorry, just a little technical glitch there. My, uh, we're, we're using the online version of, of some of these programs to, uh, to show slides, and uh, it hiccuped and didn't quite like it. So I'm just going to make sure I get back to the rest of those images. I've still got some more images to share. The morning sky is full of planets, and it is really nice to see um, the different views that there are. Um, lots of things going on in the early morning sky. Turn off the satellites. We'll bring back our time here. If you go tomorrow morning, tomorrow is the 27th, the moon will be just over by Venus. Here we have sort of a, a close-up view. You've got this beautiful view of the bright Venus, the really thin crescent moon. It'll probably be a challenge to spot unless you have good skies. And then farther up to the right, bright Jupiter, Oops, just coming off the map there. And fainter Mars. Over the next week, these planets get closer together. Venus kind of stays roughly where it is, and the moon quickly moves out of the scene. I'm still not getting my proper image here, and I'm just going to get the thing woken back up. Sorry about that. Um, this is the, the part of the sky to watch. Over the next few days, like I say, the moon gets out of the way, but Mars and Jupiter in that upper right corner get really close together. On the morning of the 29th, the morning of the 30th, they are really, really close together, well within the field of view of a pair of binoculars. And in fact, um, they're in, within the field of view of a pair of binoculars now. I think we'll be able to fit them into the telescope field of view and see both of them as actual little planets. I'm, I'm hoping that that will work out if we have clear skies on the morning of the 29th or 30th. 
Now we have another planet in the, I guess it's in the morning sky. It's way, way over farther in the south. Saturn has been moving farther and farther from the morning sky into the evening sky. And so it's kind of, I guess it rises about two in the morning now. So it, I guess it's a morning planet, but it's not as early as those other ones. It's quite far out of the field of view. So it is difficult to um, be able to see. Um, yeah, these the slides are just not cooperating. Um, but Saturn is getting higher and higher earlier and earlier in the, in the uh, sky. Soon it will swing over to the evening sky and we'll have a great view of Saturn. Now Saturn, of course, the ringed planet is well known as one of the jewels of the solar system. And as you sort of get into a nice telescopic view, there's the rings tilted at a little angle to us. There's all of those moons going around. And of course, those moons move over the course of a few hours, some of them, and uh, a few days, the other ones to orbit around the planet, an ever-changing view. And it really is one of the best views in the sky. I mean, Saturn through a telescope is really one of the best things that you can, you can spot. So we're coming up to the season where that's going to be visible um, early enough that we could actually do a live stream or something like that. So that's going to be on our schedule. We're aiming for that over the summertime sometime, and we'll see exactly when we can get that, uh, when we can get that going. Okay, I'm going to try one more time here for this, uh, this slide. Not sure why. Yeah, the online version of, uh, of this is not working. So I'll have to show you some of the shots. Uh, Andy and Ruby sent in a great shot of the planets this morning. And so it would be great to be able to show it. But unfortunately, I'm not able to, able to do that right now. So what we'll do is uh, I'll see if I can bring that to you a little bit later in the show. And we will move on. If we go back to our evening sky... There are no planets to look at, but there are other things, of course, to look at. Our constellations, uh, we've really lost the winter constellations already. Like, if, if you get out there after sunset, I mean, the sky is still bright at 10 o'clock. So you're really not getting a, a dark sky till quite late. And those winter constellations really have disappeared. By 10.30, when the sky is actually dark, you might still see Capella in the uh, in the northwest and you might still see Castor and Pollux over here but really the everything else is gone. The Big Dipper is finally looped around the North Star and it's starting to come down into the west a little bit. It's been pretty much overhead for the last month or so. The spring constellations are already heading down to the southwest. Things like Leo and Virgo are um, already setting into the into the west it seems like the spring constellations are visible the least of all because they just start becoming visible and then the nights start getting shorter and shorter and we really lose the chance to see those constellations for as long whereas um, you know some of the other constellations like in the fall you can see the summer triangle well into November basically we've talked about Boates before the ice cream cone constellation um, it's found from the Big Dipper here. You follow the arced handle of the Big Dipper and it arcs to the star Arcturus. This is a well-known constellation and it's a, a very useful one, particularly coming up this weekend because it uh, will let us find a couple of, uh, a couple of significant things. It's also um, the guide star that we use to get to the, constel the um, binocular challenge of M3, which is right in about this part of the sky. Rising in the east, we have the summer sky. The summer triangle is already rising. The three stars uh, of the summer triangle rising in the east. The constellation Hercules, we've featured uh, the, the globular cluster M13 before as a binocular object. That's another one that you can see in binoculars. And basically, down below that, we've got the Milky Way area. I'm actually just going to make it a little bit darker. Here we are about 11.30. Now you can start to see the Milky Way through this area. And where the Milky Way hits the horizon, that's basically facing towards the center of our galaxy. The center of the galaxy is just right in about 
about there. And uh, you can tell because there's all these stars and star clusters and nebulae and things like that in there. As that part of the sky rises a little bit higher, we can see the constellation Sagittarius, which is it's kind of shaped like a teapot here. And um, so the teapot and then the steam is the Milky Way coming out of the, out of the teapot. M22 that uh, Ulrika saw in her binoculars is right about there, which matches exactly. But you can see that there's, there's lots of stuff in here. If you have a pair of binoculars and you just scan around the sky, don't go too fast, but like scan nice and slowly and you'll just see little clusters of stars and little fuzzy patches and bright parts of the Milky Way all throughout that area. Really, really beautiful area of the sky. Um, oh, hey, Fallon and Phil from Steinbach. Nice to see you. Um, Eric's asking what month to see Saturn. Um, we'll probably do an event for it uh, in August or September, but I'm going to start looking for it in the next couple of weeks or so. It'll just be one of those things where I'll try and get up at, you know, four in the morning and take a picture, stuff like that. Probably won't go live for things like that, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and let's see, there was another question here that went zooming by. Oh, lots of, uh, lots of co compliments to, uh, to Ulrika and to James for their, uh, for their images there. Okay. Well, interesting. Looks like um, I'm going to have a little bit of trouble with the PowerPoint here. It really has um, pretty much crashed. That's not good. Okay. Um, Phil asks, will the Milky Way be that easy to see around June 6th? Well, you know, um, that's the great thing about this Stellarium here. Here's June the 6th. And... Um, you know, at 1.30, it's coming up out of the south and going high up into the sky. Actually, I guess that would be there. There we go. If, we, if you went more in the early evening, it'll be a little harder to see because we've got the moon coming into the sky, and that moon will wash out the, the sky a little bit. But if you wait for the moon to go down, so if you, you know, you go around 1.30, the moon will be out, start to set and once it's out of the sky, the sky gets nice and dark. Um, we are sort of coming into the new moon time right now. And so it'll be perfectly placed for some of our uh, things that we can see. Um, those darker things that we want to see here. All right. Um, we're going to move on. Unfortunately, some of the things that I have visuals here for are still giving me problems. So why don't we go to cool space stuff. Okay, so cool space stuff. There's where do where do we begin? The uh, the Boeing spacecraft, the Starliner, went up on its test flight to the International Space Station, docked with the space station, um, everything worked. It came back from the space station, it parachuted down, landed in the, in the desert of New Mexico. Pretty much a, not quite flawless, but a really good test flight. That probably means that the next time they fly it, they'll be allowed to have astronauts on board, although NASA might require one more test flight. We'll see. I know that th with uh, the tensions with Russia, there's some eagerness to not have to depend on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The um, Dragon spacecraft put out by SpaceX is continuing to fly to the station. There's a couple of them up there. Some of them fly with astronauts to take crew back and forth, and some of them fly robotically to take supplies and things like that. The next one that's supposed to fly actually had a little problem, though. It, it arrived at NASA, and NASA does uh, acceptance testing to make sure that, you know, everything's working, and they actually found a problem with the heat shield. And... So essentially, they sent it back. It's kind of like if you're at the restaurant and you get a hamburger and it's like half raw inside, you send it back. That's basically what NASA did with the, with the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, SpaceX is not commenting on this, although it's hard, to, it's hard to understand either if they missed it in their quality controls, that's a big problem. If they didn't miss it but sent it to NASA with a known defect, that's even worse of a problem. Going to have to see how uh, the explanations come out for this. So it, it's a little bit of a wrench thrown into the sort of whole uh, benefits of the commercial space program, the idea that, oh, c companies will, will do this and they will make it much cheaper and stuff like that. Well, 
if they're going to make it cheaper by skimping on safety, that's maybe not the best kind of option. We'll have to see what this happens. Hopefully, this will be the kind of issue that will fix the problem rather than uh, it continuing and, and eventually causing um, problems or even accidents down the road. So that, that'll that be uh, quite uh, an interesting situation. No comment from SpaceX at this point. They're basically saying nothing at all. Um, and if you've seen Elon Musk recently, it's really hard for him to say nothing at all about anything. So I, I imagine that something will be coming out soon. We also have... Um, Someone was posting about the Starlink. Oh, Val, um, the Starlink satellites during the lunar eclipse. Yeah, there was, um, all of that was thanks to Fallon, by the way. She she was uh, out at the at the spot and I was just babbling on, not even paying attention. And she said, hey, look over there, the Starlink train. And we all stopped and turned and got to see it. So so thanks for that. Uh, and then I was able to pass it on over the, over the live stream. It really was spectacular. Um, there are more launches coming up. Uh, of those they go every couple of weeks or so it seems and so we'll try and alert you when there's going to be more that come over Winnipeg not every launch is positioned so that it'll be visible over a particular area they basically go over a certain longitude of the earth and uh, it just depends luck of the draw whether we get to see them or not uh, let's see um, Tiffany says yeah you don't want a problem with the heat shield yes I would agree uh, of all the things to have a problem with the heat shield is probably not the one you want. Um, okay, let us move to, um, we're going we're gonna to save our Mars uh, updates until uh, we have Dr. Clutus with us next week, but uh, there are some uh, exciting developments happening in some of the research on Mars, which we'll, uh, we'll bring to you. And we will also try to, this is really unfortunate. I'm going to see if I can just get a couple of these images in another way. Okay, maybe this will work. Do a couple of changes on the fly here so that we can show stuff. Okay, coming up this week, Monday night, May the 30th, 11.45, PM Central Standard uh, Central Daylight Time. Probably nothing will happen, but there's a possibility of a meteor outburst occurring at that time. Now you've seen meteors before. We've talked about them on the show. Every every year there are some regular annual meteor showers that occur that are sort of known in advance, and they have a certain amount of you know. Sometimes it's a few dozen meteors an hour. Sometimes it's you know. 50 or maybe even up to 100 meteors per hour. So that's like one or one every minute, every or one every 30 seconds, something like that on average. That's a really good meteor shower. Well, this potential one may be in the range of 1,000 meteors per hour for about an hour and a half on Monday night. The news is just sort of broken. I started getting media calls today. I hadn't talked about it because it's one of those probably not going to happen things. But some basically it's now at the point where it's going to be worth going out. If you have really um, sort of casual plans on Monday, I would suggest you just bump that to another night and just keep your Monday free. Um, so what's, what's causing all of this? Basically, meteor showers come from comets. Comets are big balls of snow and ice that orbit the sun. They're a few kilometers in diameter. They go around the sun in sort of oval paths. They get closer to the sun and farther from the sun. When they're closer to the sun, the snow and ice melts and it releases dust behind the comet and the comet grows a beautiful tail. And so you've probably seen all sorts of pictures of, of comets um, with the beautiful tail. People often mistake those for meteors, um, but basically they're the, they, they are the source of regular meteor showers. Because what happens is, as these comets go around the Earth, if the orbit of the comet happens to get close to the orbit of the Earth, that trail of material that's left behind can actually intersect the orbit of the Earth. So the Earth passes through basically comet dust at the same time each year as it goes through. So it, it's like a big dust bunny in space where there's lots of dust. And each of those pieces of dust hits the Earth's atmosphere at 
tens of thousands of kilometers an hour. And the friction and the pressure of the impact basically ionizes the atmosphere, vaporizes the particle, and you get basically this bright column of light that we see as a falling star. It's there for a second, maybe two seconds, and then it's gone. They, that can happen anytime because there is a little bit of dust out in space. No matter how, how uh, well you sweep your house, you're always going to have a few specks of dust there anyway. Um, and on a given night, you might f see a handful an hour if you're in dark conditions. During a meteor shower, you might see up to 100 an hour. Well, this Monday one, there's a possibility of much higher. The reason is, the comet that is the source of this meteor shower has disintegrated. As it went around the sun in 1995, it basically fragmented into a whole bunch of big pieces and probably billions of smaller pieces that are now in a big cloud. So instead of a comet going around the sun every five years or so in this case, it's this big cloud of material. So the cloud of dust that is left behind is kind of bigger than normal. And Normally, the Earth doesn't actually come close to this particular comet trail, but because it's broken up and because it's expanded, the Earth might just nick the edge of the comet tr trail on Monday night. It's going to be one of those either it happens or it doesn't kind of thing. It's not like you're going to see, oh, it wasn't very good, it was only 200 meteors an hour. No, either there's going to be a thousand meteors an hour, or there's going to be the regular rate of like one or two. So we'll know pretty quickly if the predictions are correct. Now it turns out that we have perfect views of, um, of the event because if we set up our constellations here, I actually, uh, I had all these prepared in advance and our PowerPoint, actually it looks like it looks like the museum's website might be down. That, I think, is what is happening. Even better. Okay, so let's take a look at... Um, we'll come back to this image, but let's take a look at the sky at that particular time. Oh, goodness, there we go. Here's the sky. The whole sky. And... We've got the Big Dipper over here, sort of in the high up in the west, almost still overhead, a little bit over in the west. You've got the bright star Arcturus over here. The meteors will come from this area, kind of between Arcturus and the Big Dipper. Actually, very close to the area where M3 is, for those of you that uh, looked for the binocular challenge. Now, that doesn't mean that's where you should look. They're going to radiate out from there, so one might go out this way, and another one might come out this way, or out this way, or out this way. So they're all going to radiate from that position. So to see this, you want to get, first of all, to a dark location outside city lights. It only gets so dark in this time of the year uh, for, for us in Canada. And if you're farther north, it might not even be dark when this starts. Um, but if you're looking at the sky... Uh, let me just make sure I've got it set for the exact right time here. Uh, 11.45, you're basically looking almost straight south uh, and high overhead. I would suggest that um, you get away from city lights, you avoid any other lights that you have, make yourself comfortable, you know, make sure you have a lawn chair or bug spray or a blanket or whatever you're going to need so that you can just sit and watch the sky uninterrupted. Because even a thousand meteors per hour it's easy to miss a bunch. Each meteor is literally don't blink or you'll miss it. So you want to make sure that you're watching the sky a whole bunch during that hour. Otherwise, you'll miss a large number of the meteors. Of course, if you have a camera, take as many pictures as you can and just, you know, hope that a meteor occurs while you're taking the picture. That's basically all you can do. Um, you'll get a whole bunch of pictures of the stars, and if you're lucky, one or two pictures of, of meteorites. Um, it does need to be clear, because meteors are burning up in the very upper part of the atmosphere, well above the clouds. If it's cloudy or rainy, you won't be able to see it. We're going to go for a live stream. Um, I'm, I'm going to see what the weather is like on Monday, and we'll drive to a spot that's, you know, hopefully something close like Bird's Hill, um, Oak Hammock Marsh would be great, Liberia Park, any place, any 
park that is sort of uh, relatively dark would be great. I'll see where the weather is best and uh, we'll try and do a live stream because if it happens and if the weather is sort of typical May weather, there'll be a lot of places around the country that'll be clouded out. So hopefully if it's clear here, we'll be able to at least stream and take a, take a few pictures or whatever. We've got the all sky camera ready to go. Um, Pamela asks, we'll be taking pictures or videos. Yes. The plan is to, um, we have an all sky camera that pretty much takes a picture like this every two seconds. And so any meteors that happen in those two seconds will be frozen in time. Um, uh, so basically we'll be able to, to see those and then count them. Now this is an opportunity for you to do some backyard science too, because this comet stream is pretty unknown. Counting the number of meteors you see is actually valuable scientific data. And it's about as simple as it gets. Um, probably what we'll do is we'll, you know, every 10 minutes start a new count. And, you know, so at, at uh, 11.45 to 11.54, 59, count the meteors, and then start a new count, and so on. And you'll be able to actually plot the, the profile of this, and the number of meteors and how bright they are will actually help scientists understand what happens when a comet like this breaks up. That's pretty, uh, that's the kind of stuff that you would normally have to send a spacecraft there to actually study in situ, but instead we get to just see the effects of it. Now, it's entirely possible nothing will happen. I do... I was, I was hesitant to share this too early. Um, the article that came out today um, on the American Meteor Society, though, kind of changed my mind. They're still couching it in caution, but they are also pointing out, you know, basically what has happened is this meteor shower was given the name the Tau Herculids, because in 1930, it was seen once and then never again. And it came from the region near the star Tau Hercules. So that was its name, but it was kind of a lame meteor shower because it didn't repeat. They associated it with this comet, and then when the comet broke up, suddenly there was some renewed interest here. Um, and basically, it looks like this, the science that is sort of predicting some activity this year also predicted, sort of retroactively predicted, the um, only other visibility as being back in 1930. So it seems that, you know, the science is pretty sound. It's still iffy, but, uh, and, and I mean, anything to do with comets is always iffy. Comets are very unpredictable creatures. They can fragment and disintegrate, or they can get super bright without notice. Um, so take it all with a grain of salt. But I plan to be out under the sky watching because uh, it looks like it could be a really spectacular event. So the comet's name is uh, 79 or 73P Swashman Walkman 3. Uh, Swashman and Walkman were the two astronomers that discovered it on some photographs that they were taking, and so they have credit for it. But it is uh, not a comet that is normally very impressive at all. Um, we, we can hardly see it. And now that it's broken up since 1995, it really isn't observable except in very, very large telescopes. So hopefully we'll have the chance to see some residue of it on Monday night. Right now, my plan is to go where the same place where we went for the eclipse and, and just sort of set up there and, uh, and so on. Once I know the location, I'll, uh, I'll extend an invitation. I mean, it's nice to have more than one person when you're out there in the dark, uh, observing the sky. Um, we heard the coyotes that one night, and I, I think it would have been uh, much more unnerving if I was there by myself rather than with, uh, with so many of you. So anyway, that'll be coming up on Monday night. It's a late night, I know. Um, the prediction lasts from 11.45 to 1.17 a.m. That's the window where this event could happen. So that's what we're going to try for. All right. Let us move back here and try our last couple of images. Okay, well, it looks like the website is back up. That's a good sign. Okay. Well, I do have some more images of uh, stuff to show you um, that I'll have to 
come into next week's show because the uh, program is just not working here. But we will. Oh, let's see. We got a couple of questions here. Um, oh, thank you, uh, Ben. Um, ben asks, will JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, be able to see what's going on? Um, well, uh, James Webb Space Telescope is not quite operational. They've got the mirrors lined up. They're now going through what we what we call the instrument commissioning, where basically each camera starts taking its own individual calibration pictures to make sure that the instruments are are working and um, they can calibrate um, basically all of the settings and things like that. So that's just in the process of that. It won't be useful for this particular observation. Um, however, the comet is actually being observed regularly by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope did some imaging of it back in 2005, I think it was, after the breakup. And there are other observatories that are sort of uh, touching base with, with the comet. So we're watching that evolve. Um, most of the uh, details of this particular uh, meteor shower prediction, though, are really just gravitational computations. We, we sort of know, well, if stuff came out of the comet moving at this speed, where would it wind up in its orbit around the sun, and how close is that to the Earth, and so on. So, um, basically what we need now is the observation to test that theory. So either we see a bunch of meteors, and those th that theory was correct, or we don't see a bunch of meteors and the math was slightly off somewhere. Now they do, they do say that basically if we see the meteors that tells us that the, the particles were moving away from the comet faster than average, which basically would indicate sort of a very explosive kind of breakup rather than a, a comet that just sort of fell apart into piles. So that would tell us something about that, but it's entirely possible that we won't see anything um, even though the math is correct, it, it, it'll just be that the, the particles just aren't uh, moving fast enough to generate visible meteors. There are also people that listen to meteors on shortwave radio, if there are any uh, ham radio folks out there. Uh, if you tune your radio to an FM station over the horizon, so all you'll get is static because um, radio is limited to the line of sight basically. Shortwave will bounce up off the ionosphere and back down, but FM, basically, if you're over the horizon, you can't hear it. So pick a station in, like, I don't know, Indianapolis or someplace like that, um, tune to that and listen to the static, and when a meteor goes off, that will actually cause a bounce in the radio waves, and you'll briefly hear for a second or two that station from Indianapolis come in loud and clear. And so that indicates a meteor. So you can actually count meteors without ever seeing them. You can count, it works when it's cloudy, it works during the daytime. So if you're interested in that, look up radio detection of meteors. It's it, literally, you can do it with just a regular transistor radio. If anybody has those anymore, I mean, you can't do it with an iPhone. You need an actual radio. But um, that's another way to take a look at this. That's a really, really good, uh, good point. Um, let's see. Len. Um, Len says, what time will I be live streaming? Uh, the plan is to go live at 10.30, mostly because it's dark then, and I'm just going to start things up, and I'd rather have everything up and running before it gets fully dark, so that way, if there's a problem, I can see what's going on. Well, I'll bring the telescope out, and if it's clear, we'll, we'll take some pictures of something until the meteor shower sort of is scheduled to start, and then we'll switch to the all-sky camera. If nothing happens, we'll probably shut down around 12 uh, or 12.30. If something does happen, we'll stay as long as something's happening. So 10.30 on Monday, that's, uh, that's when we'll get started. Uh, a couple of other questions here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, hearing a meteor. Yeah, yeah Tiffany, it, it actually is a, a really um, smart way to detect these things. There's a guy, I, I, well, he's in Halifax, but um, he, he does a lot of this kind of stuff. And at first I thought it was, it, like, it, it just sounds kind of ridiculous. So I'm, I'm listening to the radio to detect meteors, but it's perfectly valid and it gives data. You don't have to worry about it being cloudy or you can even do it during the daytime. So for example, some people 
it'll be too bright. Like for example, if you're up in, in Swan River, Cali and the crew up in Swan River, it's probably going to be too bright for you still by 1130 to really get a good view of the stars. Um, but if you used a radio and there were meteors happening, even though you couldn't see them, you'd be able to hear them. So it is a cool way to check this out. Yeah, indeed. Well, the entire computer is now starting to fail. So I'm a little leery that it might be something on my end. So I'm just going to shut down all of my non-essential programs. There we go. Okay. Um, we still have a few other things that I wanted to talk about. We have coming up um, the, the new moon period, Milky Way period. Get out there and, and uh, take a look at the sky. We have uh, the beautiful planets in the morning sky. We are coming in towards uh, having Saturn come up. And um, we also will be heading in towards the summer solstice. Coming up in, you know, third week of June, basically we have as little darkness as possible. So we're going to be switching gears a little bit and we've got a couple of programs in June that will talk about daytime observing, what you can do during the day. It occurs to me that now I have to do one on uh, radio meteor observing so I can provide a bit more information on that. Uh, that's a perfectly valid one. Um, we're going to talk about the sun. We're going to talk about looking for planets in the daytime. We're going to talk about observing the moon in the daytime. And then we'll also get prepared for summertime when, of course, a lot of people have the chance to be out of the city away from the, uh, the bright lights of the city and get a good view of the stars. Coming up next week, we'll have uh, Dr. Ed Clutis, who, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is a, a, a geologist working on the Mars rover. He works right here at the University of Winnipeg. And um, that will be a, uh, a really interesting talk. It's, uh, it's still kind of mind-blowing that, you know, there's a guy that works down the street from me that is working with the Mars rover. Um, we will also be taking a look at uh, the highlights of the June sky. We'll do our summary of what's up for the June sky, all of the events. We'll do our June binocular challenge, which is now not going to be M22 because Ulrika has already bagged that one, so I'll find something else. And we will be able to um, get ready for our summer sky. Uh, a couple more questions here. Afalan asks, when's the next evening planet visible? You know, it will be when Saturn rises early enough to be in the evening. So we're really talking September, October, when we really start getting sort of a comfortable evening planet that uh, will be visible. Mercury does put in another appearance, but it's really not visible from Manitoba. It's, it's at a very low angle, so we, we really won't have much of a chance until Saturn and then uh, Mars uh, and Jupiter all sort of migrate from the morning into the evening. Uh, Linda, hey, nice to see you, Linda. Um, will you be able to see the meteor shower in other parts of Canada? Yes. Uh, so the um, basically the, the times that I gave were in central time. So you'll just convert that to Pacific time. So for you, that would be 9.45 p.m. to uh, 11.17 p.m. Now that might be pretty early for the sky to be dark. So we'll have to see um, whether you'll be able to see it that far west. But uh, it does sort of favor Central and Eastern uh, North America just because of the way the Earth happens to be turned during that narrow one and a half hour window. So hopefully you'll get a chance to get out there. But, uh, oh, and uh, Fallon says, Arg. Yeah, I know, it's, uh, it's killing me too to, to try and plan to get up at, let's see, if I want to observe at 4.30, I've got to get up at 3.30 to start getting things set up and at 3 30 it's pretty easy to convince myself to not get out of bed so i uh, i feel your pain we will get there though the it's the great thing about the universe it always comes around it always you know changes things up and eventually you get the views of the things that you want so that's it for this week sorry about the technical glitches i will bring you all the images that uh you missed um next week and uh we'll make sure that uh our display system is working properly. Remember that um, we do have uh, the dinosaur exhibit and the dinosaur show and Legends of the Northern Sky. Right now the Planetarium Museum Science Gallery are all open Thursday through Sunday until the end of June and uh, starting the Canada Day weekend we're open seven days a week. So for the summer we'll be open the whole time but right now we're not open 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So uh, we we still have a few people just sort of showing up. Um, we're not quite back to our pre-COVID um, operations yet. So just give us a call if you're uncertain uh, or check the website and you'll find out when we're, when we're going. Thanks everybody. Really great to talk to you all. Um, and I do apologize again about the, the technical glitch, but uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, it's actually clear right now, beautiful night. I'm going to set up the telescope and uh, you know, tonight when it gets dark, 10.30 probably, I'll, uh, I'll go live for a little bit on my Scott the Skywatcher page. And uh, if you want to join me there, we'll uh, see what we can find in the, in the spring sky. All right. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you all next week. Good night.